my last words on part two of my analysis on the missing Bradley sisters, Diamond and Tianda, were, quote, whoever responsible, I do believe they were close to the family, but I'll let you decide. A random abduction is just not on the table for me. Whatever happened at 3526 South Cottage Grove Avenue on July 6th remains a two decade long mystery, but I doubt it's as much as a mystery as some think. Sometimes the answers are right there." End quote. This is the Missing Found Podcast. I'm your host, Jaden Harlow. Before we get into the case, I have a few details to share about the show. The Missing Found is an investigative podcast focusing mainly on unsolved missing person cases in the Black community. The cases that I cover have either gone cold, have little to no media coverage, or have gone without conclusion. You can follow the show on Instagram at The Missing Found or on Medium at The Missing Found to read our original script. I also would like to mention that we have a case suggestion form in the show notes or description box that you can complete to submit your case suggestions that are of the Black and Missing. The show is now available on all major podcast platforms, including Apple, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Please be sure to give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. To access all things of The Missing Found, you can visit our website, themissingfound.com. I ask that you please like, share, subscribe, and comment to share your thoughts on this case. This is part three of case episode 15, The Disappearance of the Bradley Sisters, Diamond and Tianda, breaking down the new investigation discovery special and podcast on the missing Bradley Sisters. On Sunday, August 20th, 2023, Investigation Discovery premiered a new special on their Disappeared series, delving into the missing persons case of Diamond and Tianda Bradley, largely known as the Bradley Sisters. The special included Pam Childs, a retired detective who had a decade-long storied career. She brought together a group of retired detectives to take a closer look at one of the most puzzling cold cases in Chicago history involving two small children who just seemingly vanished. Pam works with retired detectives Annette Farrick and Ed Carroll, and investigator Foster to help solve the case and examine what really happened on the morning of July 6th. I saw the comments, questions, and confusion from viewers after watching the investigation discovery special on the girls. I watched it after everyone else because I wanted to take my time to watch it as a viewer then watch it again as an investigative journalist, writer, or sleuth. Before we get into part three of the analysis, I want to give you a briefing on the case. You can also listen, watch, or read the episodes through our podcast, YouTube, or read on Medium. The original case details. On Friday, July 6, 2001, at around 6 a.m. on the south side of Chicago, Tracy Bradley, the mother of three-year-old Diamond Bradley and 10-year-old Tianda Bradley, had left her two daughters home while she went to work that morning. The girls' sister, Victoria, had a birthday on the following day. Their two sisters, Rita and Victoria, spent the night with their grandmother. Sadly, neither Diamond or Tianda would be there to celebrate Victoria's birthday. Once Tracy returned home from work just before noon, on July 6th, She was met with a complete and startling silence. After Tracy rummaged through her apartment while yelling the girls' names, she soon realized that Diamond and Tianda were nowhere in the apartment. With Tracy frantically concerned on the whereabouts of her daughters, she discovered an odd note. Since then, there has been no sight of the girls, with speculation of sex trafficking, murder, sightings on social media, a voicemail that mysteriously disappeared, persons of interest, lies, and an odd camping trip, and all of this with a common name, George. What we're going to discuss in this case analysis is the updated timeline that adds a little more perspective and fills in some of the gaps, analyze the new details from the ID special and podcasts, and conclude with my opinion. 
Before we get into the case, I want to first go over the important names, locations that are mentioned throughout the episode, and the timeline. The names. There are some important names that you may hear throughout the case. Tracy Bradley, the girls' mother. George Washington, Tracy's boyfriend, father of Diamond Bradley. George, the babysitter slash neighbor, a neighbor who sometime babysat the girls. We learn his nickname that Tracy's children refer to him as Porgy. Shalia Bradley Smith, Tracy's aunt and the girls' great aunt. She lived in Minnesota at the time of the girls' disappearance and has been vocal throughout the years of finding the girls. Rita and Victoria Bradley. Tracy's other two children who were at their grandmother's apartment at the time the girls went missing. April Jackson, Tracy's sister and the girl's aunt. She has been a large advocate for the girls and her family. April is eight years older than Tionda. Mary Tiny Bradley, Tracy's mother, who is now deceased. Diamond, George Washington's wife at the time. George Washington Jr., the son that Tracy and George shared, whom she gave birth to in 2003. George gained full custody of his son. Locations. Home. Lake Grove Village Apartments. This is where all four of the Bradley sisters live with their mother, Tracy Bradley. Their apartment complex was located in the Oakland area of Chicago and five miles from the Bronzeville area. School. Doolittle Elementary, located only two blocks away from home and the school Tionda took summer classes. Grocery Store, Jules or Joe Osco, the local grocery store that is located in the Lake Meadows Shopping Center. This grocery is located across from Doolittle Elementary. You will hear this store being called Jules. It is assumed that this is the grocery store that Tionda refers to in her note. Tracy's Employment Location in Grandmother's Apartment Complex, Robert Taylor Holmes. The public housing project in which Tracy worked and where her mother, Mary, or Tiny, and the Bradley sisters' grandmother lived, now demolished. The Timeline, the most vital part of the case. July 5th, 2001. Sometime during the late afternoon or evening, Victoria and Rita were both dropped off at the Robert Taylor Holmes apartment complex to stay the night with Tiny, Tracy's mother, and the girl's grandmother. At 7.10 p.m., the game start time. Tracy had two friends over to watch the baseball game. It was the Chicago Cubs against the New York Mets. They all were drinking this night. Diamond and Tionda were present. It is said that they arrived around 9.30 p.m. and left around 10.30 p.m. It is believed these friends were Porgy, which is George, the babysitter, and his friend Stephen. At 10.30 p.m., the two friends leave. Later, after the friends left, a male neighbor came over, but according to Chicago Sun-Times, he never came further than the front area of the apartment unit. He claimed to have not seen the girls. This does not mean the girls weren't there, just out of sight while he was there. July 6, 2001 the day the girls go missing. Late night, early morning. Tracy spent the night at George Washington's house. Initially, she said that George came over her house and stayed the night. What this means is, she left the girls home alone overnight. 6 or 6.30 a.m., George Washington took Tracy to work. She had the first shift at 7 a.m. They left from his home. At 7.58, Tracy called home a few times during her break, assumingly to check on the girls while she was at work. She was concerned but assumed they were asleep because there was no answer. She called a total of four times and left one voicemail telling the girls to pick up the phone. The times she called were 758, 806, 845, and again at 845. At 817 a.m., the outgoing call was made from Tracy's home to her cell phone. It was discovered that this may have been Tionda calling. This call went unanswered. She left a voicemail to say, Ma, George is at the door. This alleged voicemail was found out on July 7th, the next day. 
At 11 a.m., George picks Tracy up from work. Both Tracy and George arrive to her home shortly after. Both Tracy and George went upstairs together. The girls were nowhere in sight. At 11.29 a.m., George calls the Bradley residence to let the girls know that he and Tracy are on their way to pick them up. There was no answer, so he leaves a voicemail to tell them to get ready, gather their clothes and blankets in preparation for the camping trip to Lake Schaefer. 12.21 12.21 p.m. George Washington drove Tracy to Jewel Osco to purchase a birthday cake after borrowing $20 from George, or Porgy, the babysitter. There is a receipt to support this timestamp for the grocery store visit. After the grocery store visit, they both returned to the apartment and this is when the note was found on the back of the sofa next to a pile of clothes that states they went to the grocery store. At 12.25 p.m., George calls Chandra, a woman he was also dating. Between 1 and 6 p.m., after returning home and seeing that the girls were not there, Tracy begins the search for her girls. George Washington drives her somewhere along 35th Street on the bridge that's headed towards the lakefront. George tells her to call Chicago PD and drives off. Tracy did not call. Tracy did not call because she feared her other two girls, Rita and Victoria, would be taken from her. Tracy, her family, and the community went searching for the girls by conducting their own ground search, excluding George. At 6 p.m., police were finally called. A heavy search ensued. Tracy and George were both brought in for separate questioning for 22 hours. Family members and others were also brought in for questioning. As discussed in Part 2 of my analysis on the forgotten detail, or the less spoken about detail, It has been revealed that both Diamond and Tiana left their home at some point in the morning to walk to school, Doolittle Elementary. The school where Tiana attended summer classes and was scheduled to be in school on this day, Friday, July 6th, the day the girls go missing. This was not mentioned in the special, but it was mentioned in an interview that Shalia Bradley Smith did with The Vanished. After watching the special, as of today, I cannot confidently confirm if that is true or not. This detail may be shared in a later episode. Soon, you will see that this timeline is flawed. What we know now. A love story with George Washington. It's no secret that Tracy and George had a relationship, but we didn't know the details or an inside look of their experience together. Tracy and George started dating around 1995 or 1996, which is around five or six years before the girls went missing. Tracy truly loved George and was all in for their relationship. Tracy's sister, April, recounts how Tracy loved George and how she was happy with him. We quickly learned that the relationship was one-sided. This is not to say George did not have love for Tracy, But from what I've gathered, it was not reciprocated in a way that matched the commitment and love Tracy had for him. We can allude to this because though they dated for five or six years prior to the girls going missing, he did not have much of a relationship with any of Tracy's children at the time, nor wanted one. In fact, Rita recalls how George did not really like them or want them around. The contact with the girls were minimal. Tracy was a mother of four in 2001. Rita and Victoria remembers how they would never be around him unless he picked them up from their grandmother Tiny's house, assumingly with Tracy. But other than that, there was very little contact and a relationship that just did not exist. Tracy would get picked up and go to his house or he would come over her apartment mainly at night while the girls were asleep. I found that interesting in telling of him and Tracy's relationship. Because if you're dating a man that amount of time and he does not have a relationship with your children, then that is odd, and some may disagree. This is why him suggesting to take the girls on a camping trip is an oddity that I will get into shortly. It seemed as if Tracy wanted more from George. She wanted him more than he wanted her. There was a startling mention that George was actually married throughout the time he was dating Tracy and several other women. Now, this is not new information to me, but many don't know this. We know that it's a dangerous game by having a relationship with a married man and a married man having a relationship with a woman outside of his marriage. We've seen how this transpires in other cases. 
George's wife at the time was named Diamond. You will notice that her name is identical to then three-year-old missing Diamond Bradley. This was not a coincidence, but more of an intentional reprisal from Tracy aimed at George since he believed or wanted to believe that Diamond was not his daughter, which DNA tests have proved that he is, in fact, the father of Diamond Bradley. It has also been said that George knew he was the father, but did not express that to Tracy, assumingly because he did not want to be the father of Diamond. This detail makes you question to what extent would he go to rid himself of his responsibilities to Diamond. The Camping Trip The camping trip was also another topic of discussion in the special. Though this is not new information, we know this, but it is a large part of the investigation to understand the plans for that day and that weekend. I've discussed the camping trip in depth in part one by discussing the location, distance, and the plans. The camping trip still makes no sense, but it does if you make plans that you know you won't fulfill. Those that understand, understand. In the special, we learned that George wanted to take Tracy, Diamond, and Tianda on a camping trip. This was his idea. It was not mentioned in the special, but the camping trip location was supposed to be at Lake Schaefer in Indiana, a two-hour drive from Chicago. In an interview, Shalia felt that the trip was a shock. She thought it was strange that he would want to take all of them on a camping trip. George and his family would camp, but him taking Tracy and the girls was atypical. This lets me in on how distant his relationship was with Tracy and her daughters. It gave me all I needed to know. What I've gathered from that segment is that a family trip of this sort was largely out of character for him. It makes you question if there was some ulterior motive behind this camping trip. Now, I'm not alluding to the girls to be harmed on the trip, but to use an alibi that he had made plans for a family trip and they just so happened to go missing, separating him from any involvement since he had plans for a family trip. Tracy claimed to have purchased a tent for the camping trip, but it is not clear if a receipt was ever produced to verify this information. If so, when was it purchased? Then at what time during the day did Tracy purchase a tent? If we knew those factors, it would add perspective and some validity to the claim and potentially the scheduled plans they had for the weekend. If that receipt was produced 20 years ago, we haven't heard about it. If it wasn't, then I wonder why. Possibly because it never happened and the trip was never going to happen. There is a possibility that the trip was either made up by George, Tracy was under the impression that the trip was going to happen, or George and Tracy made the trip up to use as an alibi to support the reasoning why the girls were left home alone and not with Rita and Victoria. It was mentioned by both Rita and Victoria that the plan was to take Diamond and Tianda first. Then the following weekend, they would take Rita and Victoria. The reason for the split, according to Victoria, is possibly because they would not have been able to afford to take all four girls at once. We have to remember that it was Victoria's 10th birthday on Saturday, July 7th, the following day after the girls went missing. This is why the cake was purchased in the middle of the girls being unaccounted for. Both Rita and Victoria were said to be at their grandmother Tiny's house, but Diamond and Tianda were said to be home alone. Victoria was the birthday girl, so it makes sense to take Rita and Victoria first on the camping trip, then the following weekend to take Diamond and Tianda. This is where things just doesn't make sense. If Rita and Victoria were at their grandmother's home, and it was Victoria's birthday, what were her birthday plans? As I've stated in the other analyses, a 10th birthday is a milestone birthday, so you would think there would be some plans set and laid out for her. Instead, the plans were to take one set of the sisters on a spur-of-the-moment camping trip. Then, they end up missing. Intentional or by happenstance? I don't know. Some forget that Tianda was the second oldest, then Victoria, then Diamond. Rita was the oldest. Taking a two-hour drive totaling four hours to and from is an expense. 
Then, to turn around and do it again the following weekend would be another expense. The cost would be more versus taking the girls all together and celebrating in Indiana. I mention this because due to the cost is possibly why all four girls could not attend the trip. This is why I don't believe a camping trip was ever in the plans. The thing I don't know is the significance of this story. If it is ever found out to be untrue. Law enforcement has not come across anything to suggest that a camping trip was actually scheduled for the weekend. We can't ignore the fact that people have their reasoning behind what they do and why they do it. I do wonder how birthday girl Victoria was going to celebrate her milestone birthday if her mother and two of her siblings were going to be two hours away at Lake Schaefer. The game. If you remember in the previous analysis, I mentioned Tracy had some people over to watch the game. The two men who were there were Porgy and his friend Steven. They had a few drinks and could not remember much about that night, but they are confident in saying that the girls were present. This was around 10.30 p.m. After that, things get fuzzy. It's not clear, as of now, when Tracy left her apartment to go over George's house. The unidentified calls. It was shared that there were incoming calls throughout the night to Tracy's home. The calls were not lengthy calls, just calls here and there. An outgoing call was made to George's home and an incoming call sometime around 2 a.m. Law enforcement is not sure who made these calls. They know that Diamond did not answer the phone, so it could have been Tianda? Why would Tianda be calling George's home? Unless Tracy not being home is factual and she called to check in on the girls at a late hour to make sure they were okay from George's phone. Tianda may have had his number written down in case she needs to get in contact with her mother. Another alternative. Could Tracy have made the call? Law enforcement does not really know. In order for her to make the outgoing call from her home, she would have had to have come home at some point. It was revealed that she actually was not home in the early morning hours of July 6th which contradicts what has been put into media and what has been communicated to law enforcement for 22 years. I will discuss this more shortly. The voicemail. Another vital part of the investigation. A voicemail was said to have been left by Tianda, saying that she and Diamond are going to the store with George to pick up the cake for Victoria's birthday. The oddity about this voicemail is that law enforcement claimed to have never heard the voicemail nor do they have it in their possession. The voicemail was claimed to be heard by family members. As I've mentioned in my part one and part two analyses, Tracy's sister had their cell phones on a family plan and she has set up the PIN numbers for the voicemails. She accessed Tracy's cell phone and discovered the voicemail from Tianda. This mystery voicemail could possibly be used as a subterfuge or it can hold factual evidence in what we know as the last we've heard from Tianda on record. The thing is, we just don't know. Families say they heard it. Then you have law enforcement say they have never heard it. The voicemail then somehow vanished days after by, quote, ending up in the wrong hands, end quote, as stated by April, Tracy's sister. When retired detectives Pam Childs and Ed Carroll asked Shalia about the voicemail, she claims that she has it in her possession. In fact, She has it in her email. The only thing is, the voicemail cannot be accessed due to a passcode tech issue, which puts her at high risk of losing the voicemail indefinitely, according to Shalia. I guess you're wondering, how did the voicemail end up in her email? This was my thought too. Shalia said that when she heard the voicemail, she used her cell phone to record the audio of it, then sent it to herself by email. When I heard this, I didn't know what to think. One thing I did know was that that was not possible. Her recording an audio voicemail using her cell phone as a recording device was not possible in 2001. Cell phones in the U.S. in 2001 did not yet have the capability to record audio or video. This feature was not mainstream in 2001. I would say that it is highly unlikely that this happened. Then, to record the audio and send it to email? 
It just was not yet possible at that time, 22 years ago. Retired Detective Ed Carroll said that he begged Shalia to listen to the voicemail, but it turned up nothing. He never heard it. To hear that voicemail piece of this case is transformative. As I've stated, it lets us in on the last moments of Tianda and Diamond leaving or being taken out of their apartment that morning on July 6. This voicemail will allow law enforcement to hear her tone, explore any background notes, her choice of words, noise, any irregularities, if there was a TV on, if Diamond can be heard, if there were any guests in their apartment at that time, any knocking at the door, and a list of other important elements that can help hear and visualize the setting. It would also help to know if there was someone else in the home while Tianda wrote the note. If you remember, Tianda never wrote notes to her mother. She would call. If someone came to the door asking for her mother and she wasn't there, her sister said that they would say Tracy is in the bathroom. They knew not to open the door. If they knew not to open the door, does this mean they never walked to Doolittle Elementary and never went to the playground? The question then transitions to, why would the family lie about a voicemail? You have to ask yourself, what significance does that hold? If the voicemail was never brought into the case, then what would be the outcome? The voicemail from what the family says points at George Washington being the one to take the girls out of their apartment since the voicemail claims that George is at the door. George, that Tiana was referring to, is least likely the neighbor and babysitter since they refer to him as Porgy. You ask why did Tracy lie about being home when she wasn't? Well, we know why she lied about it, to protect herself from jail for child neglect. But what reason would they lie about the voicemail? This mysterious voicemail alone is still one of the most prominent elements in this case today, 22 years later. It's also the most prominent unproven element. Tianda was scheduled to attend school. I know, I've covered this extensively in part one, but Tianda missing school is strange. Well, it's not strange that she missed school, but it's strange that there was no note to say she would be out on Friday. The day she was scheduled to attend school is the day she went missing with her baby sister. You have to wonder, with the new information that has been shared, why was she home babysitting Diamond when she was supposed to be in school, when Diamond could have been left safe with her big sisters at their grandmother's house? In part two, I shared a discovery about Diamond and Tianda actually leaving out of their apartment at some point in the morning, walking the two blocks from their apartment complex to Doolittle Elementary, but was turned away at the front entrance because she was trying to sneak Diamond into the school with her. This lets me know that there were no plans for Tianda to attend school this day. And if there was a don't open the door policy that Tracy set with her girls, then why did Tianda leave out? It hasn't been mentioned, but I wonder if Tianda was at school the day before. If not, when was her last day of attendance? School was out because of the 4th of July holiday, but was she present on Thursday? And if not, why? A truth and a lie. We learned at the end of the special that Tracy lied. She was not home at all on the evening of July 5th. It appears the girls were either in their apartment alone that entire night, or they were never there. I'm leaning to they were there, it's just that they were left home alone, overnight. Though not proven, I can only go off what has been shared publicly. On the evening of the 5th, on the night, he, when he say the 6th, He's talking about any time after midnight. No, I was at home. You did not go to George Washington's house? No, because I had to go to work the next day. Okay. Just that day on that day at midnight. I mean, I have to be at work at uh, 7 o'clock. Go ahead. So here's, the, here's what's happening. Well, you, you had previously told me on the night of the 5th, after dropping off Victoria and Rita, that you were at your place is that we have some information that calls were made to your home between the hours of 7 and 2 a.m. That's right. 217 to be exact. I don't remember. And you were not home. On the 5th? On 
Well, 2.17 a.m. is the 6. Yeah. And so... 2 a.m.? Yes, yes. And it's going into the 6th? Yes. No, I was there. Well, we got the facts. We just want to, um, we just need you maybe to Maybe I did. Maybe I did. Maybe you did what? What's that, uh, Mr. Washington House? That night of the sixth. The night of the sixth. Go on, well, on to the sixth. So right. right. it, 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 it's a possibility that you left Tiani and Diamond. What do you mean? Go ahead. I'm listening. Yeah. Yeah, boy. How was that, Mr. Washington House? Tell me how you know. Because the girl didn't want the song Shane. Mm -hmm. And I remember us coming down State Street. We was coming down State Street early in the morning. We took, um, we never did get on the uh, uh, expressway. Okay. So I remember coming, us coming down. You know, we took the expressway. And we was coming up from 47 ramp. And we got off. And he dropped me off right in front of the job. And you remember that now? Yeah. Okay. What time was that? Do you remember? Oh, I had to be able to get seven. Because I had to open up. I had to open up. And I had to, because uh, I was doing serving lunch. For the mm -hmm. summer school, you know, for the summer school stuff. For the yeah. kids, so, um, park this to be. Mm -hmm. It's all right. It's all right. When I heard this detail, I was not surprised. In fact, in that moment, I felt we were further away from what really happened. Why? Because one lie can jeopardize everything else. It questions the validity of past claims. For 22 years, Tracy and her family stuck with George coming to her apartment in the early hours of the morning. He slept over, then took her to work at six something. Well, that was untrue. We know now. Tracy and George actually dropped Rita and Victoria off at their grandmother's home. On July 5th, Tracy went back home, friends came over, she was picked up by George, stayed the night, and both Diamond and Tiana were unaccounted for during this time, but assumedly at home. It still makes me question, why couldn't all of the girls go to their grandmother's home? Or why couldn't all of the girls just stay home when it wasn't really typical for the girls to be split up like that? With this newfound information, it also makes you question why would Tracy maintain a lie for 22 years? You can also ask yourself, why didn't George disclose this information since Chicago PD was questioning him? If Tracy was at his house on the night she said he went to her apartment, then something is not right. They are essentially covering for each other, right? His neighbors saw him burning something in a metal drum that he claimed that he did not own but there was charring and the outline of what looked to be a metal drum in his vehicle. Neither of them disclosed that George was never at her apartment until that late morning he picked her up from work. I would think him sharing that would help his case and possibly relieve him of involvement since it appears he was never inside of the apartment on the early morning of July 6, contrary to what has been shared in these 22 years. Looking back, I heard an interview with Tracy, and she said in hindsight, George did seem strange once they reached her apartment. She said that when he picked her up, he seemed laid back, like his usual self. But when they got to Lake Grove Village Apartments, he went upstairs with her to check on the girls since they were not answering, which was a typical because George would typically stay downstairs. On July 6, it was different. While in the apartment, Tracy yelled out for the girls, and there was no answer. George looked strange. This could have been out of concern that the girls were nowhere to be found, or it could mean something else. What we don't know is the condition of the door. Was it locked or was it unlocked when she arrived? I also wonder if anyone else had a key to her apartment. It is believed that George left that evening and drove to Gary, Indiana. Gary is only a 45-minute drive and 30 miles from Chicago. Leaving in the evening, it would be even quicker. Law enforcement called George's home around 2 a.m. and someone answered the phone. They spoke for three minutes. This person was not George. George is not home. When phone records were checked, 
they found that an outgoing call to George was made that lasted a little over three minutes. This call could have been to let George know that law enforcement needed to speak with him because this call was made soon after law enforcement called at 2 a.m. This is where the tip from a woman from Gary, Indiana, claimed that George showed up to her home visibly shaken. There has been nothing to support this claim as of yet. Once I find out the details, I will update you. The case has renewed interest, and though they won't share every detail with the public, I believe we can make sense of what is shared. My opinion. This case is as convoluted as can be. There is more to this case, and someone is withholding information. Though not proven, I know there is more. This case is riddled with misinformation and inconsistencies. This is not the first time that Tracy has left her baby's home alone. This was a regular occurrence, but it was not often that she left Diamond and Tianda home alone. Usually, it was all four girls, except this time, Rita and Victoria were at their grandmother's home. The girls were split, which was uncharacteristic. We also don't know who suggested to split the girls up. For all we know, George Washington could have advised Tracy to have Rita and Victoria go over their grandmother's house and keep the girls home to make the transition easier so they can go on the camping trip. Really, it would have been more convenient if the girls were at their grandmother's house since she lived in Robert Taylor Homes, the same project that Tracy worked in. The delay in calling law enforcement is not odd to me. I genuinely think that she was scared of possibly going to jail and getting Rita and Victoria taken from her. She knew this too well because the children of her sister were taken from her. This was something Tracy did not want to experience until she was faced with it. With a case like this, you have to wonder, who had the most to gain for these girls to go missing? You have lies, love, and a paternity test. A child that he didn't want. George Washington, from what we can gather from the facts of the case, has the most to gain. Though no physical evidence has been proven to connect him to the case, we can't ignore someone else may be involved or George could somehow not be involved. You have to analyze the facts. People lie, but hard evidence does not. What this case is lacking is hard evidence. We know George made some odd purchases right before the girls went missing. He purchased contractor bags and heavy-duty gloves on July 6th. The thing with the contractor bags, there were four missing, but he said he only used two. He claimed that he was doing work on his home, neighbors complained of the trash, and he dumped it in a lagoon surrounding Washington Park. This was mentioned in my previous analysis. The only thing is, the trash could not be found that he claimed to have dumped. Then, the hairs in his trunk. One strand matched Tianda and one matched Tracy. This again, unfortunately, does not prove George Washington is involved. It just says that at some point they were in his car. It is something to mention that Rita said they've only been in George's car less than five times and never were in his trunk. This claim completely challenges George's statement about him taking the girls to drive-in theaters and placing the girls in his trunk to avoid having to pay the cover charge for the children. When you make one lie, you have to ask what else could be a lie. This is a case that has what seems to be very little trace evidence and mainly recounts from those close to the case. I believe this was no random abduction. Now, it's not off the table, but I do believe it was someone they knew. A case like this was executed in the perfect way, leaving nothing behind. I do believe the person or persons involved are not too far away. When you look at a possible motive, you can almost create your own opinion on who was involved and why. I will let you formulate your own opinion. With the evidence supporting Tracy not being home at all on the late evening of July 5th into the early morning of July 6th, well, any time on July 6th, when she said she was, it is difficult to grasp onto because for all these years we've learned of her being home and leaving the girls for a few hours, but it appears they were left overnight for several hours. I don't think it completely disqualified the timeline, but it does make you question everything else. 
We have to remember that someone still most likely came to their apartment and took the girls. The only ones who knew they were home alone, according to Tracy, were her and George Washington. The only other person that had to know was Tracy's mother and their sisters because only two out of the four sisters came over. Tracy believed George took and hurt her girls. The issue is the lack of physical evidence. This is where we are left. I'm still keeping a close eye on this case. Until people start talking and telling what they know, we truly won't know where or what happened to the girls. The search stayed within Chicago, but I believe it should have been expanded to Indiana since we now know that George has ties there. It's been 22 years. Hopefully it won't see 23. At the time of Diamond's disappearance, she was three years old, stood at three feet, and weighed 40 pounds. Diamond is a female, African American, and has brown eyes and black hair. Diamond has a medium complexion and wore her hair in braided ponytails with purple ponytail holders. She has a scar on the left side of her scalp and deep set eyes. Diamond would be 26 years old in 2023. At the time of Tianda's disappearance, she was 10 years old and weighed 70 pounds. Tianda is a female, African American, has brown eyes and brown hair. She had a burn scar on her left forearm about the size of a quarter. Tianda was last seen wearing green ponytail holders and had a scrape on her left calf. Tianda would be 32 years old in 2023. If you have any information, or leads in the disappearance of Diamond or Tianda Bradley, their current whereabouts, or any information concerning both sisters. It should be directed to your local FBI office. And I have included the link in the show notes and description box. You can also contact the Chicago Police Department at 312-745-4290. There is currently a $80,000 reward for information in the case of the missing Bradley sisters. I want to thank you for your viewership of Diamond and Tianda's case. The Bradley family is still awaiting answers. We know people just don't vanish. Someone has the answers to this over two decade long mystery. The perfect crime at the right time. An open opportunity. And that one holds the answers. Hopefully, We don't have to go another year without knowing. I also don't want you to place blame on anyone. I understand the circumstances, but we are far past blame. 22 years past it. At this point, we just want to find out what happened to the girls and who's responsible. As always, please be safe, be vigilant, and always be aware of your surroundings. May God bless and keep you all. And what is he hiding? George, can we talk to you for just a moment? No comment at all. There's no comment at all. There was not enough to charge George with anything, charge Tracy with anything. On the evening of the 5th, on the night, he when he say the 6th, he's talking about any time after midnight. No, I was at home. You did not go to George Washington's house? No, because I had to go to work the next day. Okay. Just that day on that day. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. And do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua 1.9